maybe five minutes, is that what we've got? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, um, we could take the opportunity to um, start brainstorming. We might have to finish up this brainstorm a little bit later. But if we think about cost share opportunities, so right now the cost share opportunities are to help cut, to help burn. Uh, we've got funding available for volunteer fire departments to help uh, help work on, um, if, if a volunteer fire department will send some equipment and some people to a private lands burn for cedar trees, they can receive up to uh, $15 an acre uh, as an award to try to incentivize getting them out there, which is a win-win for volunteer fire departments and for ranchers because the departments get some training on fire in a non-emergency setting and the um, ranchers have uh, more equipment available to them and uh, a safer prescribed burn. What are some other ways we can incentivize people to get to work on their cedar trees? The fence lines, so the age of the fence lines, and so they'd be worried about burning um, because of, of they might lose a lot of their fence, is what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, you know, with those concerns to go look, you know, Alex, boy, I can't wait till we can do a prescribed burn tour. I, I hope we do it every year. And I think it'd be, it'd be fun. Like, I, as you were saying it, it my, my wheels were working and I was just remembering um, the really successful tour we did uh, several years ago with Audubon, Ron, um, the grazing and birding tour. And one really cool thing about burn ground is the birds are phenomenal too. I, this could, it could be a really fun event and I think we just really need to capitalize on that. We need to get the staying virus under control so we can do more of that fun stuff again. I don't see you. Yeah. 
you can cut and cut and cut and cut, but it just doesn't do the same as a fire. That's for sure. Yep. Yeah. No, it's it's a really good point, and I'll share. So, so Panville Task Force are working um, on burner Bob coloring books. So burner Bob is a quail and he likes to do prescribed burning um, to save his habitat and his friends. Now, Burner Bob, um, I sit on a national landowner board uh, promoting um, public-private conservation. And uh, the, the gentleman, my, my fellow board member from Georgia, created Burner Bob to tell a story of prescribed burning and how important it is uh, down in Georgia in the Longleaf Pine region. Well, we're bringing Burner Bob to the Sand Hills and to the Great Plains. And so we're developing a coloring book and a storyline for this cartoon character to try to share the message that way. And then um, we really have to get on our um, on Farm Bureau. You know, Farm Bureau works a lot with curriculum. We need to keep talking to them and go to your school boards. Go tell them that you are concerned that your kids know more about the dang rainforest than they do about rangelands because Science shows we're losing grasslands at a far more alarming pace uh, than, than these rainforests. All right, I'm getting kicked off the internet constantly, so I'm going to transfer this over to you. Hey, that would be fine. Good thing I shortened this up so that we could have discussion. <laughs> uh, in just not in the correct order. Yeah, so I did bring a few of the coloring books. These coloring books are the ones from the Longleaf Pine Forest area, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be having new ones coming out for, for our region, which will be pretty fun and pretty interesting. But we've got to keep telling the story. We've got to start with the young, you know, all age groups. You're exactly right. That'd be pretty great. Yeah, we had the, so we did have a legislative study um, on cedar. Uh, that would have been in 2019, was it? 20, <laughs> time flies, 2018, 2019. We, there was a legislative study and both, uh, you spoke, didn't you? Yep. Yeah, Durak and I both spoke and testified in front of it. And uh, we shared a lot of information for the Natural Resource Committee uh, of the state legislature, um, not a lot became of it, but there was no legislation that came out trying to restrict prescribed burning. And that was our, our big concern. And something that we still monitor is that we don't want any more any more restrictions for prescribed burning or cutting or anything. And I'm working awful hard to get it so that we can cut and burn trees for 12 months out of the year instead of stopping during that nesting period. Uh, May through July, I think that that is hurting us drastically. So Durak is transferring his presentation and we'll have it shortly. Sorry for the odd delay. No, that's okay. Was there an issue with the landfill closing so much and the livestock coming up this way? Wasn't there any? So yeah, when the Flint Hills lights on fire, um, 
They just do it all at once and it goes and smoke settles in Lincoln. Um, it, it's just kind of how it works. And uh, we get blamed uh, for prescribed burns out here some, and there's just uh, uh, issues and, and people do get concerned about it. Uh, we keep telling the story and we're very diligent about saying that that smoke is not us. You know, that's, we're not doing that. We're a lot more mindful of the, the pollution that can come from prescribed burning. Uh, but the other story that if you do talk to anybody about it, the story that needs to be shared is if we continue not doing any prescribed burns, mother nature will take care of itself. And all we got to do is look to our states to the west to see what's happened out there. When we do prescribed burns, we can time it. We can time it so that we don't uh, have that big of an issue. But if mother nature does a, a wildfire, you know, if a wildfire breaks out, we don't have control over it anymore. You have another uh, flash drive? I have a flash drive. Yep. I have. Do you think people would come to a demonstration? Uh, we're working um, in Bedford to have a demonstration for equipment. Um, to try to get landowners maybe a little bit more familiar with some of the equipment that's available out there. Uh, do you think that that would be an interest around here to kind of showcase some of the equipment that people could have or hire to come on their place? Is that a concern at all? All right, we are winning. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Well, you'll have to hit the space button too. Let's see here. I think. Oh, yes, that's it. Is this yeah I think it's I think it's fine I think it's just because I set it up that way I'll go I'll talk to you then <laughs> Hopefully we don't have that. Yep. 
Okay, now we are ready to go. Hey, all right, sorry for the delay. I kept getting kicked off internet so I could show it in the room, but then if I showed it in the room, uh, internet wasn't working for those of you at home. If I was just working on internet, I couldn't show it in the room, so we just completely killed my computer and switched. Uh, but I've been waiting to get to, to this part of it. I think this is, uh, you know, we, we heard a little bit about this from Sarah a little bit ago about uh, you can, you can kind of sense it and feel it, the, the ways of integrating management and how to start moving towards that approach. And like is often the case, you know, science is just lagging behind good management. And what we're trying to do is learn how we can take some of the things that are working and scale that up. And so, so what we want to do is actually show you some of the first examples of what I've been really getting pressured with, which is provide written materials that, that is a science-informed strategy that'll work. And uh, so what we'll start to have in the future is actually a guide that puts some of what we know, and, and actually Sarah used a great word talking about what fire does. It, it makes our systems less susceptible or less vulnerable to woody encroachment. Uh, that's one of the things that we're going to break down. We're actually going to show why risks of grasslands have changed and how to better manage those risks. And cedar is a primer, right? Like you get cedar, but woody plants bring with them other woody plants. So we expect more diverse woodies to follow. So I like that we're thinking about the big picture in the room today and just how to conserve grasslands regardless of what any species does. So as we walk through this, uh, this will eventually be material. And we, we've actually had multiple groups, game and parks, uh, the NRCS, multiple groups talking about how to use this to help support priorities and investments, and we expect to keep moving from there as we go forward. I'm going to have to have Shelly to tell her that it's not advancing. Oh, I, I found the hidden button on our computer. So let's see if this will work. Somebody tell my partner in crime we're still off where we want to be. Somebody said, there you go. She's not changing up there. Ah, OK, here, let's, uh, I have an idea. I go back here. So while, while Shelly's doing that, one of the things that we showed earlier today, right? We showed and broke down the economics tied to Woody encroachment. I'm still, I'm still waiting for, like for, as that starts to sink in, how do we start communicating the importance of rangeland in agriculture, right? Like those are not small dollars and getting that story out, but you can see it's coming. All right, I think we're there. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. But, uh, but then we're starting to break down the proven solutions that we see multiple groups doing, and that's what we tend to know about. And we're still looking to uncover how groups are adapting their practices and what they're doing to scale this up. Awesome, we've got, we're live folks, we've got movement, I think. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> hey, that's the right direction. It's just I know, not screen. I know. <laughs> so, so what we want, what we see is, as ways of approaching this as we move forward is there's key things that, that we're seeing that everybody should understand in terms of how to better manage this issue. The science technical guidance that really goes all the way back decades tied to what do you approach in grasslands was basically, okay, we see a problem over there, right? It's a symptom of a problem that we don't want. 
So what do we see? We see that mature trees or patches of trees on a landscape. And so what do we do? What we do is we then go fix the problem after it occurs. So we bring out the big Tonka toys and so forth, like Megatron, but with usually mechanical or chemical instead of fire. And we start to treat those bigger encroachments. And that's possibly kind of what rangelands have done. We've tried to fix problems after they occur. <coughs> we haven't fundamentally managed the ecology of encroachment. We shouldn't manage based on what we see. We shouldn't manage to fix problems, especially given the scale at which this is moving. We should manage based on fundamental biology and what we know. I think that's what we can start to do. And, and for those of you that are here, you can actually see this image that was created. We were trying to break down the simplest ways of just understanding the encroachment process. So this is what we usually focus on. That's what remote sensing can monitor. But this is the late stage of encroachment. In reality, there's this kind of blue arrow here. It's kind of hard to see live. But this process here is the reproductive phase. We have always ignored that. So the reproductive phase is really important. How does intact grasslands go through an encroachment process? What happens is you have somewhere a seed source. That seed source produces a cone. That cone produces seedlings or babies all over that creates new seed-bearing individuals that spread across what used to be intact grasslands. Fundamental ecology 101 of encroachment. I'm breaking this down because we ignored this entire ecology. We have to manage the ecology of encroachment if you're gonna win. Uh, so otherwise we wouldn't be seeing these big scales of change. But controlling this is not working. We need to control the entire biology of how this works. So I wanna walk through again, like what each of these five stages means. So the encroachment process, it starts when we think of intact grasslands. Now, what are intact grasslands? And realize I'm in Lincoln, so I keep hearing definitions of grasslands that include trees in them. Grasslands are treeless ecosystems at large scales. I actually have to define it that way just so we remember what they used to be, right? Grasslands are treeless at large scales. And if you think of the management philosophy tied to those ecosystems, those are the good old days, right? We're talking about rotating the animals around. We're talking about managing for diversity and heterogeneity because we're not having to manage new threats coming in that disrupt a very stable and intact system. Once those new threats come in, you're making hard choice about what to do with your time and where to put your money. So as this process occurs, you then go into the dispersal phase. That's the start of encroachment. So think of dispersal in terms of you have a treeless system but it's now contaminated by seed. No different than if we're gonna manage zebra mussels in lakes in Nebraska, right? It's not when you have zebra mussels spreading and you observe them, it's when the reproduction pathway gets there. So intact systems going to dispersal, that's the start of encroachment. That's the resource concern is when this happens. And as this takes place over time, you're going from intact good old days this is now contaminated by seed, and what we should be thinking about is high maintenance boundary management. So this, and I'll show you the data on this, they occur near seed sources in terms of recruitment. Seed dispersal is most effective, and, and it's shrinking those grassland habitats like we showed earlier. What we usually, and maybe the places that very few people start, but where we started to see progress earlier, was going from managing this to actually managing seedlings, right? So if you're managing seedlings, congratulations, you're one of the few that are acting earlier. And that's that second stage of encroachment. This is early successional brush. So if we're managing that, that's early successional brush. We're not in the intact grasslands anymore. And early successional brush should be early detection rapid response. That's what we do with all invasive species that pose risk to the things that we want. So don't ignore the seedlings. And in fact, that's the why I have the caution sign. What happens if we ignore the seedlings? You get a mature seed bearing plant that then goes through this process and that's when you get expansion. So you're losing intact acres to now woody encroached acres. So if, if you think about this, what we've done traditionally is focused on, maybe, focused on a reactive approach down here and what we're suggesting is we need a new proactive approach tied into this uh, across all these phases. So proactive approaches can win. And if you just step back and you think about managing risk and making grasslands less susceptible, 
Just think about putting percentages tied to this. What percentage of the sand hills historically was treeless ecosystems at large scales, not contaminated by seed? 95%, 98%? How much did we change by exposing the sand hills to seed? So we can actually think about, even on your own land, what proportion do I have intact? Why is that important? Those are the areas that have the least risk, the least susceptibility to woody encroachment. Once this starts, risk increases. And the more you wait, the more our system becomes more and more vulnerable. Even when you treat it, like Sarah showed, you then have to do more because it comes back. So I want everybody to understand what happens here is as this occurs, risk increases. And we have a number of data points that I just want to show a glimpse of, a brief primer, to show how we know that this is the issue. And one of the ones for the Sand Hills and all the Western Great Plains is understanding something called denial, right? We, we've had denial about the potential for woody encroachment. And this denial comes from 1890s to 1920s science. When, when we settled here and we had that intact grassland ecosystem of the Sand Hills and the rest of the Great Plains, there was debate between Frederick Clements, who's a notorious grassland ecologist, and Charles Bessie, notorious forest ecologist. And you can actually see this historical debate in the literature of can trees grow here? Imagine if they could. It is undeniable this will benefit human well-being, is what said back then. Uh, we now have tested that hypothesis, right? And we can test this hypothesis. Here's considered to be a precipitation threshold where woody plants can't encroach and spread. And so if you're left or west of that precip line, right, it's too climate limited for encroachment to occur. If you're east, it's disturbance limited, meaning fire. So that's this, this hypothesis. Well, we can look at all these sites in the sand hills. Dylan Fogarty actually did this. And all these sites run public land sites, meaning we've had seed sources for a long time throwing seed out there. And where do we observe encroachment? So that's the question, do we observe encroachment? We observed it all the way out here in the sand hills. It's not possible, it's happening literally now. The only places that didn't have encroachment, you can kind of see these white dots here, those did not have a nearby seed source. The reason we didn't see much of this out here historically is because we didn't have seed sources nearby and it's drier and sandy soil so the rate is slower. So the density of trees is higher when it's wetter in the east, but that doesn't mean it won't occur. So we need to move past that 1890s to 1920s science and understand it is happening. And the sooner we get on this, this becomes really easy. The more we wait, it becomes harder and harder. But uh, you can see it where the initial signs of encroachment are happening in areas where we thought it couldn't. Uh, but again, that, we've improved on, on that knowledge and that science by now. So we're not asking, is it possible? Then we had Dylan out there going in the sand hills saying, where does encroachment end? Which becomes a fascinating question that that's what I'm asking in the sand hills proper. So not too far from here is Halsey National Forest. That's the figure on the right. Not too far from there is McKelvey National Forest. And so what we have here is where these transects start, that's established long-term seed sources. So think of like windbreaks or tree claims on these forest sites. Where does encroachment end today? We're trying to find the end of encroachment. Not is it possible. And this, every one of these little squares is a 100 by 100 meter plot. And what you're seeing here down below, this is thousands of meters uh, that, that Dylan and, and his crew were sampling in. And just what you can see at McKelvey, right, is you see this, this dispersed, diffuse spread, right? It's not tons of trees, but you're seeing scattered spread. But what you're losing is intact acres to encroached acres. And imagine managing miles of spread all over the second largest intact ecosystem of true prairie in the world. So, so that's just what we're seeing. Of course, McKelvey's just lagging behind Halsey. Halsey's just further along. But see how there's spatial order in the spread? And what we think is happening here is that mature trees that have longer distance dispersal, one tree happens to escape the trap and survive and it grows taller, then you have new seed source further out and the seedlings start filling in behind it. Re so what you're seeing, right, is that one tree out there. And what's the big deal? It's one tree. We're losing intact acres to encroached acres and it's just filling in over time. 
And eventually you're like, wow, now I wake up and I have a real problem here. But it's manageable. And that is because when we're looking at these, the evidence keeps pointing to most of the density occurs near the seed source. So look at the distance to K, the distance potential seed source, that's where all the density and recruitment is. So uh, here's 250 meters. All the recruitment's happening within, right, a football field or two. In fact, if you look at this graph on the right, 95% of encroachment of, of new recruits occurs within two football fields of a seed source. 90% occurs within one football of, field of a seed source. We can manage football fields, right? It, what, what hurts is if we have to manage every square inch of the sand hills. But this is where the problem starts and moves from. It's, it's just understanding that fundamental ecology and how this is working. Now, Sarah showed this through time lapse and it's confirmed with our data in areas and that was really awesome example of uh, this idea too of if you wait, what happens? So in the Les Canyons, here you have a cedar dominated uh, vegetation area that's been that way for decades. Right next to that's the grassland patch that's been that way for decades. Fire comes through, consumes all the vegetation. How long before cedar comes back? If you wait until cedar dominates the site, cedar seedlings start coming back within two years. If you kept grassland intact, cedar seedlings weren't coming in until 15 years, right? Woody plant systems want to be woody plants again. Grassland systems want, they have feedback center that want to maintain themselves as grasslands. So our lifespan of treatments is not the same. Waiting to act and reacting to the problem, you're losing lifespan on your treatments. You're losing return on your investment. Protect, protect, protect. I'm like the doctor up here, right, that you're going to see that tells me I need to exercise, brush your teeth, right, good habits. This is range health. Prevent transitions to a woody dominated state. Prevent mature seed sources of encroachment. Prevent intact areas from being encroached acres. Those are new scientific principles that a lot of you, I think, already know, but maybe we just, we've never done it so early like a place in the sand hills. I'd love to see a place that didn't wait and where we can enact this early. So the understanding that ecology is key, number one. That's just a glimpse of new things we've learned by working with groups. So, I mean, some of you already know this and, and have said it, but the data is there to support it. But I wanna get into this next phase of risk and vulnerability and spatial game planning. And when we think of risk, we often think of what we have to lose. And we've already talked about some of this today about systems level consequences. And all this has now been talked about in the science there's an Eastern Red Cedar Science Literacy web page and fact sheet that we talk about. It's compiled all the science that's been done throughout the Great Plains related to this issue. There's decades of science on consequences and they span so many areas. But the other way of thinking of risk is actually that line of vulnerability. So how we manage systems is really important and we use these vulnerability frameworks to do that. This is actually from uh, ecology and they use this for wildlife to try and better manage vulnerability to wildlife with big threats. And, and the way to think about this is that there's three components they talk about that manage vulnerability, sensitivity, exposure, adaptive capacity. Now I like to tell stories and metaphors. So if you think of how to manage risk, I, and since it's so cold out, uh, let's pretend it's not and that the sun is shining. Like, I tend to have pale skin, so I get sunburned fairly easily. So how do I manage my risk? Well, I can manage my sensitivity by putting on sunscreen. And I'm gonna use SPF 4020 because I need it. Somebody else might be less sensitive and only needs SPF 15. So that's sensitivity. But I can also just go hide under a shade tree and change my exposure. So what we said in rangelands was it's okay, you can increase exposure to these seed sources because we're going to balance that by inserting controls that reduce your sensitivity. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as getting sunburned. If you have a hurricane coming into the Gulf Coast, just the exposure to your hurricane has impacts. It doesn't matter how good we are with our engineering, right? And that's woody encroachment. What we've learned is that exposure is more important than sensitivity on this issue. So all the fire in the world in the Flint Hills our data shows they're still losing ground and they're burning every year. And that's because of increased exposure. If we're going to win to woody encroachment, we have to manage our risk. 
And what did we do? We removed fire from the ecosystem, so we increased our sensitivity, our susceptibility, and we increased seed sources, so we increased exposure. The double whammy of increasing risk. I can't, I can't paint an easier picture as a scientist. We did both those things. There's a reason we're losing the biome. If we're going to reduce these issues, we have to better manage sensitivity and risk. And we can do that now, and we can do it with a spatial game plan. Adaptive capacity, that's agency cost shares. That's our partners. That's working with neighbors. That's prescribed burn associations, right? How to, how to help do more than just what you can do by yourself. You're increasing your ability to adapt to the problem. So yeah, fire, historically, right? It made our grasslands less sensitive and there weren't many seed sources because we had so much intact area. But where do we work today? We often work in these areas shown here that's highly reactive. And they're doing the same thing thinking about cheatgrass out west now. So if we punch a hole like that blue one with brush management, well, the issue is that we killed trees, but we didn't change our exposure or our sensitivity. We don't follow up with fire and there's seed sources all around it because it's still contaminated by seed. So our best approach to doing this won't work unless we manage risk. Killing trees doesn't work well unless we reduce our risks. Like that's what's coming. I think what we, if we implement that kind of strategy, again, that's the winning strategy that can work. And that's why our other programs weren't as impactful as they should have been. I mean, we didn't have this kind of data and knowledge and we weren't thinking spatially about this, but that's why they haven't been as impactful. So I'm gonna walk through how we might do this. Uh, and I, ultimately, I think there's infinite actual treatments that you all might be able to implement for that kind of winning approach. But just, again, break this down with me. Let's say that we're starting over here in a state we didn't want. So first thing we have to do is get out of this denial of what restoration does. Most of what we've tried to do is say, implement mechanical removal of that system you don't want, and it'll go back to that intact ecosystem. And that's a myth. A single restoration doesn't do this at all. A single restoration does not take you back to an intact treeless system. A single restoration, uh, use, here's actually an example of, of actually a, a fire in the less canyons. All this is cedar. You have this wildfire move through, right? Killed 85% of cedar, but it missed the stuff it didn't burn. And there's all these escapes inside. And that's where it came back because it reinvades faster, right? and it does it with strong spatial order where there's seed sources still. And we didn't follow up. We did a restoration or we had a wildfire and we lose ground again. And right, that story of Texas, we sell the ranch three times to pay for brush management. The reality of a single restoration is you go back to a dispersal phase. You're still contaminated by seed. So understanding that seed contamination point is really important. Uh, this is what we see play out all throughout the Great Plains is this trap. This is a management trap. We want to avoid that going forward. So instead of doing that, which by the way, like Jeremy Maestas out west, he gave me this slide, and he, he talks about this with conifer management or cheatgrass. He said, what we're doing is we're talking about, look how nice my furniture looks in the living room, and the house keeps burning down. Uh, I talk about it like the capital of Lincoln is moving an inch every month, and the engineer's telling you that it's going to collapse, and we're like, yeah, 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 but we're going to renovate the fourth floor. It doesn't matter how nice we make the fourth floor if the system collapses, right? So we've got to have a strong foundation that we're moving towards. So if we're going to do restorations, and when I talk to a lot of landowners in areas, they hate the incentivization of a single restoration because it reinforces bad habits. It's kind of what Sarah was talking about of not incentivizing grasslands. If we do this, if you're going to get back to an intact system, biologically speaking, we're talking about seed bank depletion. That's the reality is if you're down here, you're rehabilitating your system. So what did Sarah show in the time lapse? They did the clearing and then they followed up with fire and then you follow up with fire or you get the loppers out there. You're for sure avoiding any mature seed bearing tree. So just nothing above six feet, please, right? They produce seeds. And you're trying to keep that encroachment away from that intact acres, but you have to rehab the system to do it. And that's the reality when we're here when we wait. And there's groups doing this. Uh, I showed that example where in Kansas they've closed yield gaps and they've built almost a hundred thousand acre core 
this is their goal. We're going to deplete the seed bank over time using everything we can. And that can happen because they have low viability. And they don't last that long. So let's, let's say though, it's like, ah, oh, but I can't see doing that. And we go to this next phase of actually trying to keep it in dispersal trap. So let's say you have a windbreak here and you want the windbreak because windbreaks obviously have value, right? You just want to avoid it from eating your whole lunch. What could we do different? Well, again, most of the recruitment, 90% is a football field away. 95% are two football fields. So do high maintenance boundary management. That's what only fire can do this. Fire can consume seed. Doesn't mean it'll get all the seeds, so maybe you carry around loppers, right? To get the ones that it misses. Don't think, don't assume the practice is gonna meet the, the outcome you want. Target this encroachment pathway, which is pretty simple. Are there no seed leaves? Well, but if you're close to a seed source, you have seed contamination. Only fire consumes seed, nothing else can do. And for the record, that's what we range scientists screwed up. We say in the literature it was a replaceable tool. It is not. Only fire can keep grasslands intact, can consume seed, can consume seedlings, can kill mature trees, and under the right conditions can burn up entire stands and go back to a grassland. Only fire can do that all at once. If you're gonna do something different, like what we show here as you go to the recruitment phase, loppers can't work on big trees, but they can work on seedlings. But if you have big trees, you gotta bring out something else. But it, hopefully we can stop waiting until we have big trees to act because that's what produces all the babies. This is pretty simple, right? Like I think everybody can see like with this approach, what we're trying to avoid, no seed bearing plants within intact grassland anymore. And, and we just haven't provided that kind of guidance because we didn't know how important exposure to seed sources were. We just said, oh, you can control the problem. Exposure is more important than the controls. So that's what I, this is the best guidance as long as we can do it, but we're trying to figure out how to get there uh, from this condition that we didn't want. So the way I view it is I just showed you the hard way. And we have lots of acres in Nebraska that's kind of getting into the hard way. So there's the easy way or the hard way. Very few have acted in time to avoid the hard way. Sand Hills has potential to do things the easy way. And there's so much more options if we do the easy way. What's the easy way? Keep grasslands intact. Simple. Keep them intact. And the larger scale that you have intact, the more you're likely to deal with pressures as this woody encroachment continues to happen. Now let's say, okay, they're intact, but of course we have this all over, right? And more signs of how great this is than signs on this is the second most intact true prairie of the world. And I get why, because this wind is, you know, chilling my bones. So we get why it's important. And I love Barb Cooks these lines. She's like, that, this outdoor barn has saved the ranch. And, and the way she talked about it was like, it saved our bacon in certain years. And she goes, but now we're actually paying more to control it versus what we gain. And, and that's the problem. Like nobody saw this coming to where it was such a gain to such a problem. And so if we're gonna have these, we should think about how to manage it. Because what's it do? It increased risk. Fundamentally having woody plants and grasslands, it was introducing something novel, which increases risk. So how do you manage the risk? Well, if you're going to have that, here's an area with no seedlings, no mature trees, high maintenance boundary management. So this is where somebody might implement an approach where they do lots of prescribed fire here and you're just watching it, right? You're not wanting it to become a seed bearing tree. So what happens if this moves and you have a seed bearing tree there? Two football fields away, you just lost. And a single tree can produce a million cones. They are very productive. So that's an example of just what's your target, no seedlings. Of course, Shelly talked about this, some people are removing the seed sources, right? Is that seed source worth the risk? And that's just ultimately up for every person, but I think this has something in it for everybody, right? If, you're, if this is important, think about that most of the recruitment, 95% occurs within two football fields of that seed source. Now let's go to this next phase. See down here, on the south side, this is an area, let's say this one has seedlings that's recruiting into it already. So what do we do here? We bring out the loppers. Uh, it, for example, where my parents live in Missouri, right? They hay all the time. So there's cedar all around these hay meadows and hay pastures. It's preventing cedar from coming in. 
We don't talk about Hang doing that, it's just doing it. So anything that keeps seedlings from becoming mature works. The target here is no seed bearers. So, so this is an easy thing to, while you're driving around or so forth, to be able to target. But what we're doing here is a spatial game plan, ultimately the exact type of treatment, whether it's fire, whether it's something like loppers, right? We are just avoiding this mature encroachment like the plague because that's how it expands. So, so again, like this kind of strategy can work. Over here, I can see treatments or practices that you all combine in multiple ways in the real world on landscapes to just prevent expansion. And if we do remove this, remember, like that's that hard way of how we have to, there's seed left over. And that's what causes all that big boost that you saw in that really cool time lapse. So do you see the kind of spatial game plan here that's possible? And I'm just trying to set up the general, paint the picture. But to me, this is what is possible and we're seeing groups do it. And what you're talking about is taking that initial idea, which was pretty basic and saying, now scale that up and think big, right? Scale this up from being an individual management of that patch right there to thinking about how to do this across big acres. And it's just amazing to me to see the creativity of producers thinking about how they can build core areas and grow them. And that's something that we're seeing more and more tied to this idea. Instead of chasing the problem, we're talking about something where we could protect intact systems, push against the threat, and then start to grow those areas that we want. It seems pretty simple, but we've never implemented it at scales of that. So this idea and so forth, a lot of this came from a conversation Shelly and I had in Burwell years ago. I hear a lot of people talking about this in terms of how to scale up conservation and how to scale up working lands efforts. But when we go through things we've talked about today, we can see your proximity to the bigger threats that are coming, the lots of woody plants coming. We can see where systems are really intact all across the Great Plains. We have field inventory that's refining our knowledge of, yes, it can happen here. We should be ready to adapt. We can combine that with local knowledge and whatever your priorities are. And again, this kind of deal here of what if groups came together and we had communities working together to deal with big threats? Where's the community will to keep a cool place like the Sand Hills intact and to add that to that big story? Uh, and my hope is we can take that information and co-produce scenarios and customize those solutions so we understand how to do this better. Like the science is better when I learn from your experiments. I can't experiment as fast as producers can. So if I can learn from all the ways that this is possible and create core areas that are less susceptible to encroachment and fire works, but I just gave you lots of options, which was part of the earlier discussion. There's lots of ways to get ahead of this but fire works really well because it can hit all the encroachment phases. And again, I'll just come back to this. We're talking about telling the story of conserving the last grasslands. So this kind of approach of reducing our risk and how to better manage risk, I think that's something we've just not done well in the science. We're creating that. We want to get that out and, and hopefully learn from you all on how those kind of approaches are working better. We already know they're working better because we already see some of you all doing it, but how to scale that up and really prevent the kind of losses we've seen elsewhere in the Great Plains. So I think that's the, I actually, even with all the tech troubles, got done in time. But I think this is that big picture of what I'm hoping is we can have these conversations of, of who else wants to see grasslands stay grasslands for future generations. Because there's winning strategies of how that can be done that are practical. All right, that's what I've got. I really appreciate being able to share this with you all and I'm hopeful to get back out here soon thinking about how we can actually make stuff like this happen. Well, again, thank you to everyone for devoting your day and coming. Learning more about how to use the tripod. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'm going to take this and edit it so we can edit out some of our breaks and stuff and we'll get it posted. We'll post it on YouTube and put it on our website and we'll share it with you so you can put it on your website and we'll, we'll get it out as best as we can. And I might even break it out into segments uh, so that people can watch different parts too. So 
we'll we'll talk about it, figure out the best way to get it out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Thanks, everybody online. I'm going to go ahead and log off and we'll get stuff posted later on. Thank you.